Okay, hello everybody. We are so glad to have you all here with us. Welcome to the AANMC webinar, The Power of Healthy Food and Healing, Let Food Be Your Medicine. We are so glad to have you all with us. Before we begin, please make sure that your control panel is expanded. There should be a box like the one shown in the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you do not see this box, look for a double arrow, click on these arrows and your box will expand. Secondly, make sure that you can see my desktop which, which currently shows a control panel image. This is the window you will use to view today's presentation. During the webinar, there will be opportunities to ask questions. Please note all attendees are muted, so type your questions into the box indicated here. All questions will be addressed during the question and answer period after Dr. Erlinson's presentation has concluded. We will answer as many questions as we can in the time available. Oh, excuse me, we can't see your screen. Okay. Now can you? Yes. All right. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you can communicate with me using the question box. I will try to help you resolve any issues that come up. There will be a short pause between myself and Dr. Erlinson as the GoToWebinar technology takes a few seconds to shift between presenters. Please be patient during these transitions. The webinar is scheduled to run approximately one hour. If we run out of time and you still have questions, we will continue for another 15 minutes. And now let me introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Andrew Erlinson. Dr. Erlinson earned his doctorate in naturopathic medicine from the National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. In 2013, Dr. Erlinson worked on a team to develop NCNM's new Master of Science in Nutrition degree and is currently the chair of the program. As an assistant professor, Dr. Erlinson teaches a variety of nutrition courses in all the academic programs at NCNM. He also teaches courses in clinical research and mentors students on their thesis projects. Dr. Erlinson leads community-based nutrition and cooking workshops as part of the Food as Medicine Institute. Since 2012, he has been teaching classes in Banks, Oregon, reaching over 100 community members. Prior to NCM, Dr. Erlinson earned his degree summa cum laude in food science and human nutrition from the University of Maine. With over 10 years of food service experience, cooking and managing restaurant kitchens, he has a true passion for food nutrition and using food as medicine. So Dr. Erlinson, I will now turn the presentation over to you. Hello, thank you very much. Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm honored and I'm excited to be here. I would like to thank the AANMC for inviting me to be here today. I'm excited and very passionate about this opportunity to talk to you about the power of healthy food and healing and how food can be medicine. Before we get into our topic today, I want to just give you a little bit of background, even though I was very nicely introduced. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more, though, than just my schooling, and I want to talk about food story, because we all have a food story and our own connection with food. So you'll have to click and on my food you see your screen. Can just you see me? Yes, now we can see it. Just yep. Um, Make it bigger. Yeah. Everyone can see me? Sorry. So I want to tell you a little bit about my food story and how I got here today. And it began when I was a young child. I grew up in the state of Minnesota in the countryside. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to be exposed to gardening and growing our own food in our family. And that was really an interesting time for me, and, and I didn't realize it when I'm a young child, but gave me that connection with the land and gave me an appreciation for food, and I believe that helped cultivate to get me where I am today. I went on 
to get my undergraduate degree um, in food science and human nutrition from the University of Maine. While I was at the program I was attending was a conventional dietetic program, and I was more interested in the preventative side of food and nutrition. And I met a naturopathic physician in Maine and introduced me to NCNM and naturopathic medicine, and I grew a great passion for, um, for the medicine at that time. After I graduated from uh, NCNM, I was in clinical work for about two and a half years, and I ended up just recently having to step away from my clinical practice because I took a full-time position here at NCNM as an assistant professor teaching full-time and uh, developing and now chairing our new Master of Science in Nutrition program. I'm also involved in research here through our Healthcott Research Institute as a clinical investigator, uh, studying a couple of different projects with uh, food and diet, as well as mentoring students on their own research projects. NCNM also has a Food as Medicine Institute, and I'm one of uh, five physicians as a part of that institute that helps lead uh, community education. And we have a Food as Medicine Everyday program that goes out into the community and offers free nutrition education and hands-on cooking. I'm very excited to be a part of all of these positions. Hi, Dr. 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 Could you enlarge your slide for us? Enlarge the slide? Yeah, they're not taking up the whole screen. Um, I will try. Nice. Maybe, I think if you just double click on the actual slide, it makes it bigger. Um, it actually, sh it actually shows that it's the full screen on my computer. Oh, really? Okay. Can you see anything? Okay, because we can actually still see the slide. Can you see it now? Yep, now. We can see them now. Okay, we can see them now. Okay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. All right. 
I'll start back up. Sorry about that. Uh, what, so why I chose naturopathic medicine? I was really drawn to the medicine because of I, I have always wanted to help others, and I was very attracted to the preventative side of things, and really the philosophy of the medicine in supporting the whole person. And I'm going to talk about that in a few slides, but also the connection with nature and realizing that in the hustle and bustle of everyday life, oftentimes we forget about spending time in nature. And I felt that the medicine really embraced that. Part of the reason I focused on nutrition was my background and kind of, my, as I mentioned in my food story, how I get here, how I got here, but really understanding the uh, that nutrition, food and nutrition, is a big foundation of our health, and to focus on the importance of healthy cooking. It's a part of our new Master of Science in Nutrition program, and it's also a part of our community education classes. We're learning more that people are eating away from home, eating less at home, and. So we really need to get back to connecting with food and understanding how to prepare simple, tasty, and healthy meals. I apologize, I'm having te technical difficulties with my computer and I do not understand what's happening, so I just need a minute to try and uh, figure this out. I apologize. Okay, here, I think we're ready. All right. So my weekly routine, because I'm full-time faculty and, and I'm not involved in clinical work at this time, I spend a lot of time doing research, whether it's research involved with the institute or just daily research, uh, understanding the evidence base and learning more about food and nutrition and health and all the factors that play a role in that. I'm constantly developing new curriculum as new information is coming out and developing new coursework. Uh, that's a daily part of my routine. I teach. Uh, about 12 different classes here at NCNM across all of our academic programs. I'm teaching usually three days a week, about three to five classes per term. I'm also involved in one community-based education class that I teach on Tuesday nights. And fun, all of it is fun. For me, this is a way of life. It's not just a, a, a job to show up to and, and uh, perform at every day, but really something that I embrace that's a part of my life. Um, and it's a part of my family's life. Uh, and I'm, I'm appreciative that I can have that. So I want to talk a little bit about what determines health. And food is a part of that, but there's two main components, and that's our inborn determinants of health and our life. As that food and nutrition plays a, a part in that, but we have to take a look at the whole person and have respect for all the components that play a role in health. And today we're going to talk specifically about food and nutrition, but realize that we have connections on mental emotional and spiritual levels with food as well as socioeconomic and community level. So uh, I wish we could uh, spend an hour or, or several hours talking about this, um, but we have programs built around uh, all these different concepts. Today we're going to focus specifically on, on food. And that's what we do as naturopaths. We don't focus on treating disease. We focus on trying to understand what's happening in someone's life around their health and how we can identify uh, the cause and remove any obstacles to cure. It turns out that food and diet actually now plays a, a fairly large role in that. So I'm sure we've all heard before that we are what we eat, but I would like to add to that that to be truly healthy, it's more than just what we eat because we have to digest appropriately and absorb adequately, metabolize efficiently and detoxify as well as eliminate. So all of these physical components need to be working optimally for, for total health. And I want to ask you for a minute, what's your food story? We all have a connection with food, and of course food we think of as 
um, the physical food and what we eat, but we also have community ties and social ties to it, emotional ties, maybe spiritual ties or mental ties to food. And we each have our, our own food story, but there's also the food story at large, and that's the story of our nation. And that's what I want to focus on here because it's the culture and the food story of our nation that has really shifted within the last hundred years and brought us to a place where we are now seeing preventable chronic disease at an all-time high. In the middle of the 19th century, the country went through the Industrial Revolution. With the um, change in technology in the Industrial Revolution, we were able to process foods, package foods, and create foods in a way that we were, had never been able to before. And that, that exposed us to foods that we had never really in the history of um, evolution been exposed to. And if we take a look and over the last hundred years, some things that have significantly changed in our food patterns as a country, and this is part of our food story as a country. You've seen an increase in calories over the last hundred years. And not that calories should necessarily be the focus, but it's, the, it's where the calories are coming from. Prior to 1900, a lot of our food came in whole food form. It was minimally processed. We now see more and more food packaging um, and food products on stores than ever before. And it's the types of calories that are coming, as we see here, from highly uh, sweetened, uh, lots of added sugars has doubled in the last hundred years, a large increase um, in refined grains. Potatoes are the number one consumed vegetable in this country in the form of french fries. We now consume uh, over 300 percent increase in the last hundred years of highly processed omega-6 fats and that's coming primarily from um, pro highly processed food oils. Those are very, very inflammatory, and we'll talk about that today. And one of the very interesting things that we um, often don't maybe put a focus on is, our, is the change in the agriculture. It's estimated that at the turn of the 20th century, about 25% of what homes actually came from what they grew on their own land. And today, it's estimated about 1%. We've moved away from growing our own food, from connecting with the land. It's been a shift towards industrial culture and to monoculture, and it's really had an influence on how we can access food. If we look at just some basic graphs over time, we can see, as it's marked here about the middle of the 19th century, a large rise in the sugar consumption, particularly added sugars. Where this is a concern is now we're up to 152 pounds of added sugar every single year. That equates to about 25 teaspoons a day. That seems like a lot of sugar to me. And that's mostly in the form of sweetened beverages. 54 gallons a year on average Americans are consuming in sweetened beverages. If we take a look at where our um, calories are coming from every single day, I'm astonished to see that 62% of what we consume on a daily basis comes from highly processed foods, highly processed vegetable oils, from added sugars and sweets and refined grains. And if we look up here on the, the top of the pie chart, we see that only 13% of what we're consuming every single day on average in this country comes from unrefined plant foods, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. If we break it down even further and we take a look at the top 10 foods consumed by adults in this country, and I see a lot of highly processed foods, things with added sugar and added fats and added salts, not a lot of things that really nourish our body, and that's what we need for true health. Part of the breakdown in this is the amount of fructose that we're getting on a daily basis. In 1900, people got about 15 grams of fructose a day. Now, fructose is a sugar that's normally found in fruit, and 15 grams of fructose a day is equivalent to about one and a half apples. Move forward to the 1970s, we jump up to 37 grams a day. Now, high fructose corn syrup came onto the market in the 1970s, and that's probably one of the reasons that we saw a big jump. 1994, we're up to 55 grams, and it's estimated that today we're getting about 75 grams of fructose every single day. Now, as I mentioned before, fructose is a sugar that's found in fruit, 
and so we do find it as a whole food source. But it's the 74% that we're finding in processed food that's alarming to me. It's estimated that anywhere between 70 and 80% of foods on store shelves now have added sugar, and most of that is in the form of fructose or high fructose corn syrup. Why is that an issue? Because we're now seeing through epidemiological studies the correlation between the intake of sugar sweetened beverages or even added sugar in general, increasing our risk for all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease, not to mention weight gain and the increased risk of type 2 diabetes. It comes down to that added sugars in our diet increase our added risk for chronic disease. And as we understand, we know that fructose can increase uric acid levels that we typically associate with it. Uric acid, interestingly, also can increase blood pressure. And so there might be an underlying cause, and we'll see in a little bit about the um, incidence of blood pressure in this, or high blood pressure in this country. Fructose also increases triglycerides, which are inflammatory blood fats, which also put us at risk for insulin resistance. The rise of free fatty acids in our blood actually contributes to the development of insulin resistance. It puts us at risk for non-insulin dependent diabetes and also for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We have to be careful about the amount of added fructose that we're getting in our diet. I'm not suggesting that we should avoid fruits, that fruits normally contain fructose, but we do have to be concerned about where we're getting these extra sugars and extra fructose in our diet. And it's not just sugar, but it's also fat. And fat has been kind of enemy number one in nutrition for a long time in this country. But it's not fat in general, it's the type of fat. And I want to point out here that as uh, fat, has, fat consumption has risen over the last century, it's in particular this bottom line we see, the polyunsaturated fats, primarily from omega-6 highly processed vegetable oils, things that we find in soybean oil and corn oils, cottonseed oils. These type of oils are inflammatory. We know from a metabolic standpoint consuming highly processed oils contribute to inflammation in the body. And a lot of the chronic disease that we see in this country has inflammation as an underlying um, contributing factor. So we do see a rise in total fat um, consumption over the last hundred years. And it was in the 1950s when the lipid hypothesis uh, was presented by epidemiologist Ansel Keys, and his theory based on research that he had conducted was that the consumption, increased consumption of fat, and particularly saturated fat from animal sources, increased our risk of cardiovascular disease. And that greatly influenced uh, U.S. policy and guidelines in this country moving forward. It brought about guidelines that were published in the late 1970s and also brought about the low fat, no fat craze of the 80s and the 90s. Unfortunately, it turns out that the research conducted by Ansel Keys was wrong and his uh, hypothesis maybe had not led to um, the truth that we had once thought. And it's the type of fats we're getting. So PUFA is polyunsaturated. And we can see that in 1909, um, where our fats, our polyunsaturated fats were coming from. We had very little processed vegetable oils at the turn of the 20th century. At that time, most people were using things like butter, like lard, like coconut butter, coconut oil. We move ahead to the year 2000. We're now seeing that our uh, consumption of polyunsaturated fats from oils has gone up to over double. And that's alarming to me because we do know the metabolism behind these oils and how they have an influence on our health. And we do know that they um, have an effect on increasing inflammation. Which brings me to the next slide and research that was done in 2002 under helping us understand the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 fats. Omega-3 fats are anti-inflammatory fats that we find in cold water fish. People often associate it with fish oils, but we can also find it in whole food sources. 
like green leafy vegetables and walnuts, things like flax and chia. And currently we are consuming 15 times more omega-6 to omega-3 fats. To underlying chronic disease. Research shows or tells us that there is a relationship between decreasing our omega-6 to omega-3 to a ratio of closer to 4 to 1. And that actually lowers um, our risk of total mortality by 70%. And saturated fat, which has been targeted for so long and thought to have been linked to cardiovascular disease, that may not necessarily be so. The evidence isn't so clear cut, but this review of looking at over 350,000 uh, people involved in across 21 different epidemiological studies found that there was no significant evidence for concluding that dietary saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease. It's time to go back to the drawing board and rethink some of these things that we have been taught for so long. Which leads me to the concept of hidden hunger. We live in a society where we are surrounded by highly processed foods that are very calorie rich and provide us with few nutrients. The other, another concept is start with plenty. We have plenty of food to go around it's just not nutritious enough. When we don't have enough in nutrients coming in, that can lead to what we call subclinical deficiencies. And that's where the process of pathology starts. It takes years often for these chronic diseases to develop. And by constantly consuming foods that are low in nutrients, we may not notice it right away, but over time it can lead to chronic disease and metabolic disruption. Which leads me to the idea of the rise of Western disease. We have seen in the last hundred years a significant increase in, dis in chronic disease such as heart disease, diabetes, stroke, Alzheimer's. And this is a lot of this is due to the increase of industrial foods, the adding of su sugars and salts, refining our carbohydrates, removing a lot of the fiber, a lot of the essential fats, the addition of trans fats, which came around in the 1890s the addition of Crisco on the market in 1911 changed things. People began at that time to move away from butter, to move away from things like coconut oil, and to start using processed uh, fats like Crisco. Because of these additives in foods, we are starting to see a rise in insulin. Too much insulin in the system can cause inflammation. And as I've mentioned, we're seeing a rise in omega-6 fats, which also leads to inflammation. So where are we today? What, is this, what has this led us to in the last hundred years since we've seen a, a, a I've given you a brief um, overview of the change in the landscape. We now have 81 million people diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, 37 percent of the population, 75 million with hypertension, and another 36 percent have prehypertension. 25 million people have been diagnosed with diabetes, and another se it's that's 79 million people are pre-diabetic. That's almost 50% of our country has diabetes or is at risk for developing diabetes. And it's estimated that 41% of Americans in this country will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime. What's interesting to me when we take a look at this graph and the development of uh, new diagnosed cases of diabetes in this country, if you know anything about the food policy and when food guidelines came into play. The original food guidelines came in 1977. And for the very first time they told us how much of certain macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats we should be consuming on a daily basis. In 1992 the food guide pyramid came into play right about this point and that's when we start to see a rise. And If you remember the food guide pyramid, the basis of that pyramid was carbohydrates. And carbohydrates, what drive the rise of insulin and contribute to things like insulin resistance and eventually diabetes. 
What's even more alarming to me is if we take a look at the prevalence of obesity amongst U.S. children, it has gone up significantly since the early 70s. And if we fast forward to where we are today, we see that I see five on this list that are, have a factor of diet and nutrition in their etiology. So what's the solution? We've taken a look at some of the issues, a little bit about the food story of our country, and briefly how we've gotten here. But what's really the solution? We're at a fork in the road and we have a choice to make. My, my suggestion, one of them, is to increase colorful foods. The USDA recommends that we get nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. And recent uh, research shows that we get about three and a half servings on average. With the uh, guidelines coming out from the USDA from 1988 until 1999, there had been no change in the consumption of fruits and vegetables. Only 11% of Americans meet the recommendation for nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. We can do better. So what is the optimal diet? We encourage uh, that you should increase phyto phytochemical complexity and diversity in whole food patterns to avoid foods of industrialization. You may have heard, shop the periphery of the grocery store. That's where we find most of our whole foods. Avoiding the center aisles is where we find most of our processed foods or whatever. And to respect individuality to understand that we are all different, that we all have our own genetic makeup, our own biochemical individuality and needs, and to have respect for not only our biochemical makeup, but our own cultural um, and socioeconomic differences. So why eat healthy? Research has shown us that the active compounds in foods reduce the risk of developing chronic disease. And if I look at this list, I'm reminded that I saw a lot of these on the top 10 causes of death in this country. So maybe there is a correlation that we should be eating better. And as we start to identify phytonutrients and how they play a role in metabolism, we look at things reductionistically. And we can see here how resveratrol that we find in grapes and red wine, curcumin and turmeric, and ECGC and things like green tea and dark chocolate can play a role in inflammatory pathways and uh, blood sugar regulation. But we also have to remember that as we look at the uh, individual components, we have to have respect for the synergistic effects of phytochemicals within food, and that the sum really is greater than, or excuse me, the whole is really greater than the sum of its parts. And trying to understand how there's components in foods that we may not understand, that we may not know how they interact together when we digest them how they might help each other with our with bioavailability and also the energy that we find in food. So this is what we recommend as food as medicine, that at every single meal you should include fiber, that you should include healthy fats, and that you should include protein. Three simple guidelines. Including fiber, healthy fat, and protein at your meal is going to slow down the digestive process. It's going to make you feel fuller longer. It's going to prevent a, a blood sugar spike. It's going to help with digestive health. It's going to help blood sugar regulation and maybe even heart health and cholesterol levels. That you should include colors of the rainbow. Because we eat a diverse um, colors of the rainbow, it provides us with a, a wide variety of antioxidants and protective phytonutrients. To make sure that we are hydrated, drinking enough water, to include fermented foods in our diet, and to make sure that we're adding herbs and spices that provide us not only flavor, but are very nutrient uh, dense, provide us lots of phytochemicals. And just like the USDA has come up with their uh, My Plate method, we here at the Food as Medicine Institute and what we teach in our Food as Medicine Everyday program is our healthy plate model. And we feel that we should include on our plates, half of our plate to be a non-starchy vegetable. That a quarter or so of our plate should include protein. That we should be incorporating healthy fats. 
and incorporating low glycemic load whole grains and root vegetables. We put fruit off to the side, not because we want to de-emphasize the importance of fruit in the, in the diet, but we find that when we add fruit onto the plate, one of the first things that gets pushed aside are the non-starchy vegetables. So to think of as a fruit as a treat, maybe as a dessert. And of course we have water here as well. There are also some other common themes that, that I talk about here in our program. Again, to respect individuality and avoid industrial foods. To eat organic when we can. I realize that some of these ideas are not feasible for everyone. To eat sustainable, to eat local, and know where your food comes from. If you don't grow your own, try to connect with those that grow and, and understand where your food comes from. To avoid GMOs, again, to eat your colors of the rainbow, incorporate a variety of textures, and if you do eat meat, to eat healthy meat. Know where your meat comes from. So this brings us back to what determines health. And here I have an apple with some puzzle pieces. And again, our diet and nutrition is one piece of the puzzle. But we have to take into consideration the whole person and all components of who they are. And not just the food and nutrition that they may consume, but how they interact with that food as a whole. So looking forward, my vision for naturopathic medicine is that we become the leaders in healthcare. And I believe that we're headed that direction. I truly do. I believe that there that people that I saw in my clinical practice come in because they want to know more. They want to learn more. And that's another thing that we are so good at doing. Doctor is teacher is one of our uh, principles of medicine. Uh, to educate others, to empower them, to make them aware, and to help empower people so that they can uh, connect with themselves more fully in their journey. I want to again thank the AANMC for inviting me to do this webinar. I'd like to thank NCNM um, and the Health Got Research Institute and the Food as Medicine Institute uh, for their support. Here's my contact information. If you have any questions that don't get answered in our next uh, time of question and answer, feel free to email me or give me a call. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Erlinson. Okay, I just want to quick go over an event we have coming up. We wanted to invite you all to our next webinar, which will be held in October, is Keeping Your Brain Forever Young with Dr. Fraser Smith who is a naturopath, naturopathic doctor and trained at Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. He's the former dean of naturopathic program at CCNM. And just don't miss this great opportunity. You can go ahead and register for this webinar on our website. All right, we would like to open up the floor for questions. So I will go ahead and answer any questions that start coming through. Okay. Dr. Erlinson, the first question is, I recently read that since America has shifted over from butter to margarine, which has all these different polyunsaturated fat oils, such as soybean and canola oil, there has been an increase in hypertension. Do you think that regular butter is a better choice? Thank you very much. Good question. Uh, I, I do believe that butter is a better choice. Uh, there's been some research also showing that as we increase the amount of margarine that we consume on a daily basis, it actually increases our risk for cardiovascular disease. I don't know the, the exact mechanisms or connection between increasing margarine and high blood pressure, but I do know some of the advantages, um, well one, I should say I know one of the disadvantage of uh, margarine, that it is a highly processed food, that it often contains trans fats, and that's something that I didn't mention today, 
but trans fats have been linked to inflammation, have been linked to cardiovascular disease, um, have been linked to early onset dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay. In Sorry, I was going to say one more thing. Oh, go ahead. It's encouraging because the FDA is now um, reviewing the use of trans fats in our food supply and, and in several other countries around the world. Butter actually is a better um, choice than margarine. One, because it's a whole food choice. It also depends on the source of where your butter is coming from. And of course, if, if you have access to grass-fed butter, there is a benefit, and research has shown that it is higher in omega-3 fats. But butter also is significantly high in a short-chain fat called butyric acid. And butyric acid actually has been shown to help um, support the health of our intestinal cells, and our cells actually use it for energy. So uh, butter um, does have a large advantage over margarine for use in our diet. Okay. Thank you very much. For someone who is a vegan, what do you recommend as a good protein source? For uh, people who are vegans, what I usually recommend are, is anything that is a whole food source or, or minimally processed. So beans, combining things, uh, beans and grains, um, and also uh, nuts and seeds. I also like things like avocado, which are a decent protein source, and people don't realize that avocados are actually um, fairly rich in protein and fiber. Okay. As the paleo diet has become more and more popular, what are your thoughts on legumes and grains and their impact on digestion? That's a great question, um, and the interest in the paleo diet has certainly been on the rise. Um, I'm intrigued by it. I've been reading a lot, and I honestly um, am still formulating my own opinion on the paleo diet. I believe it has a lot of advantages, um, and one of the biggest advantages and one of the things that was a, one of our topics today was the elimination of, of sugar and highly processed food. the use of grains and legumes in the diet. Uh, we do know that grains and legumes do provide benefit. So I don't know if total elimination of these things from our diet is uh, necessary. Um, but I, so I'm going to have to leave it at that. Okay. What are your thoughts on brown rice and what types of food are high in fiber? Foods that are high in fiber, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, uh, things like avocados, 10 grams of fiber in one serving of an avocado. What do I think of brown rice? Um, I think just like anything in moderation, um, even whole, um, whole foods and grains in moderation I think is fine. Um, I know there's been a lot of controversy around arsenic in rice, um, but I think in moderation uh, brown rice can be included in the diet. Okay. Dr. Erlinson, we've had a lot of requests for people to see your contact information again. I'm going to show your screen again if that's okay. Okay, if you just click OK, it should come up again. There you go. All right, I'm going to ask you the next question. What role, if any, should nutritional supplements play in our diets? Are there any supplements that everyone should have in our diet, such as vitamins, fish oils, etc.? from foods, but this is not always an easy answer because we have to look at the individual. And I can't just say that everyone should take this supplement or everyone should take that supplement. It comes down to individual need. And so having to evaluate that on an individual basis 
I believe is really the appropriate answer. Certainly we do need to include more um, omega-3 fats in our diet and so we have to take a look at if someone needs more omega-3s how much um, are they getting from food, are they getting from cold water fish um, or things like green leafy vegetables um, or some of the nuts and seeds. Um, so it, you just have to really evaluate on an individual basis and I, it's not, um, I don't think appropriate or fair, or fair for me to say that everyone should uh, take a, a particular nutrient. Okay. Can you please tell me more about fructose and blood sugar? I'm trying to take it out for blood sugar and for yeast and gluten cross reactivity. I'm trying to just eat berries and find I'm craving like more sugar. Is there, I mean, I guess there a way not to uh, crave sugar is what she's asking. How not to crave sugar? Mm-hmm. Um, in, increased protein and, and, and fat in your diet will certainly help. Um, I, I have worked with individuals in my clinical practice, um, especially with, uh, particularly with sugar um, cravings or even sugar addiction. Um, because it is, um, it can turn into addiction in some cases, um, and I can suggest just from a generalization um, that by increasing the things that I had mentioned, fiber, fat, and protein, um, will help hopefully help minimize uh, some of those cravings that you're having. Okay. But again, of course, that's kind of a, a personalized question, and so I, I can't evaluate it um, too specifically. What is the best recommendation for cooking oil at home? As far as its use in cooking? Yep. Um, I guess as far as its use in cooking, uh, I often add it sometimes at the very end of sautéing and meals. So we didn't talk too much about, or really at all, the smoke points of different cooking oils and how they can be utilized. Um, but coconut oil uh, typically depending on how much it is processed, if it's minimally processed, has a lower smoke point. But maybe add in towards the end of the cooking process um, to give it some nice flavor to your, to your meal. Okay. What are your thoughts on the feasibility of natural medicine as a career? I think it's very feasible. Um, I guess it's hard to know the individual and what their goals are, um, but there's a lot of different things that you can do within the field of natural medicine. A lot of people obviously come into school thinking that they want to be a clinician, but beyond that there's other um, areas that you can get involved, in particular in research and in teaching. And as the profession continues to grow, here at NCNM we just saw our largest incoming class, um, I believe, ever. And um, we know that the profession is growing, and we also know that there's a need from the community. And people are gaining interest in natural medicine. So I believe that the feasibility of um, having a career in natural medicine um, is good. OK. Have you found any research correlating nutrition and diet with tooth health? With tooth health, sure. Weston Price, he was um, he was a dentist and um, in the early 1900s um, traveled around the world looking at the correlation between traditional diets and dental health and those that had moved away from their um, uh, traditional community uh, and were exposed to more processed foods or different types of diets than they were accustomed to, and their dentition had actually worsened. Um, so I'm not sure if that's what you're asking or the traditional sense, but certainly foods that are higher um, or more processed uh, or higher in sugar increase our risk for dental caries. It lowers the pH um, in the mouth and makes it more susceptible to bacterial growth. Excuse me, raise, excuse me, raises the pH in the mouth and makes it more susceptible to bacterial growth. Okay, thank you. Um, though getting nutrients in a wholesome, natural way is very important. Do you believe that a multivitamin made from natural ingredients can be beneficial? 
I do believe it can be beneficial. Um, if people need um, extra nutrients in their diet, if they're not obtaining it from their food, then certainly people could take a multivitamin and multimineral from a whole food source um, for extra insurance, I would say. Okay. What are your views on coconut oil? Um, it says, yeah, oh, sorry, there was a, he was in a class that was told it wasn't healthy because it can clog your arteries. So we were just wondering what your views were on that. Interesting. Um, so coconut oil, just like um, anything in our diet, we should use it in moderation. Um, and coconut oil is, although it is high in saturated fat, is actually very high in medium chain fats. And medium chain triglycerides are metabolized differently than uh, long chain triglycerides. We tend to absorb them uh, more rapidly in the small intestine. Um, and they're utilized differently in the liver. They're often broke down into ketone bodies and used for energy. So it's a different metabolic process without getting into too much detail. Um, and there is some evidence that is conflicting um, as far as how it has an effect on our total cholesterol. But what I've seen most recently in the literature is that it actually can have a small impact on improving beneficial cholesterol. Okay. Are raw vegetables better than cooked as far as satisfying the daily recommended serving? Good question. Raw versus cooked it depends. incorporating both into our diet. Um, I think that having a balance of both cooked and raw vegetables is important. Um, sometimes in raw foods we don't we are not also able to obtain a lot of the nutrients similar to when we cook foods um, when we lose through the cooking process. So it's a fine balance and I think if we incorporate both cooked and raw um, we're doing we're tr trying to cover all of our bases and maximize um, nutrient availability. Okay. What is your stance on wheat? Do you think it should be included in the diet? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yep. What is your view on wheat? Do you think it should be included in the diet? Yeah, you ask great questions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, again, this comes down to individuality, and I can tell you that there has been more and more research coming out on the concerns of wheat in particular, um, the proteins found in wheat, gluten and gliadin, and we're finding that there is a rise in gluten uh, sensitivity um, and celiac disease in this country. Uh, do I believe that everyone should avoid wheat? Um, I don't think that that's a clear-cut answer, but I think that we should, again, moderation and even minimize its use. Part of the concerns um, with wheat is obviously the source, so um, a lot of times wheat is um, exposed to chemicals and there's been links to some of the pesticides and things uh, maybe contributing to the wheat or gluten sensitivity. Um, and so I don't think that the answer is, is necessarily clear cut. Um, and I have also um, heard, this is not research, but I just have heard from people um, that I have spoken with that they cannot tolerate that the, the wheat or wheat products here in the U.S., but when they have traveled to Europe, they actually can tolerate it. And so there's something happening um, in the difference between the wheats that are grown here and grown there. Um, I'm not sure, but I'm interested in that. Um, and I think that we just need to be cautious in our approach. Um, and also, again, moderation. If you look at the standard American diet, people are traditionally eating things in the morning like a cold cereal or toast. They're eating sandwiches for lunch and pasta and things for dinner. So they're having it at almost all meals throughout the day. And we need to incorporate more variety into our diet. Okay. Please tell us your thoughts about caffeine in moderation and its effects on nutrient absorption.
Did you get that that question? I did. I'm thinking. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Um, caffeine is. Um, uh, it depends on. on the, I guess it depends on the source. So where is your caffeine coming from, um, and the amount? And I don't know if I've ever seen. Um, Again, there's been studies that have looked at coffee, if you're talking about coffee and how much coffee we should have a day, um, or if you're talking specifically about caffeine. Um, but we do know that um, caffeine has an effect on antidiuretic hormone uh, function in the kidney, and that's why we have a, di a diuretic type effect. And certainly we can excrete uh, more uh, nutrients because of that. I don't know if that answers your question Okay. I, specifically enough. I noticed dairy was not on your food plate. Can you speak to how we should use dairy in our diets? So um, in the generalization of our food plate, we incorporated more groups. And so for those people that tolerate dairy, I would incorporate that in the fat and the protein. Um, we don't necessarily dedicate an area to it because a lot of the foods that we talk about overlap different sections of the plate. Um, and I personally am not of the belief that we need to have three servings of dairy every single day to obtain uh, necessary nutrients. We can certainly get calcium from other food sources, including um, vegetables. So it can be incorporated in a diet. Um, I'm from the Midwest, so I do like cheese, but again, everything in moderation. Um, and again, individuality, because not everyone tolerates cheese or, excuse me, dairy. Um, and so it, it can be it can be incorporated into part of your diet. Again, it goes to source, so knowing where your dairy comes from, because there is research that has shown that dairy, that products that come from pasture-raised or grass-fed um, cows, certainly has a change um, in its fatty acid profile, being more omega-3 rich and lower in omega-6, which is exactly what we're aiming for. So if you are going to incorporate Okay. Um, how can we increase omega-3 fatty acids in our diet? Increasing them. So part of the, if we look back um, or remember back the slide I showed about the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, one thing that we need to consider is not just increasing omega-3s, but also decreasing the amount of omega-6s. And I get the question a lot on, well, how do I do that? And one of the best ways that we can reduce the amount of omega-6s, which comes from highly refined plant oils, like corn oil and soybean oil, is to increase the amount of omega-9 fats, or monounsaturated, which I didn't touch upon today. But we find our omega-9 fatty acids, or monounsaturated fats, high in olive oil, avocado oil, macadamia nuts, and macadamia nut oil. So those that's a... An uh, easy thing that we can do, if it's feasible, of course, is to um, substitute omega-9s for omega-6s. But as far as increasing your omega-3s, um, increasing your consumption of cold water um, fatty fish, if you eat fish, um, increasing by eating things like flax, flax seeds, uh, chia, green leafy vegetables, our, our rich source of alpha linolenic acid or omega-3 fats, um, and walnuts are a rich source. Okay, thank you. And then this will be our last question I'm about to ask. If anybody has any further questions that didn't get answered, please feel free to email AANMC or Dr. Erlinson himself. And the last question will be, please share us your top three tips for increasing efficiency of both absorption and deduction de detoxification processes in the body. Sorry, can you repeat the question? The top three recommendations for absorption and detoxification? Yep. Um, I, 
Um, that's a great question. Top three things that we can do. Um, transition, if you eat a, a highly processed um, a diet that's high in processed foods, um, one is switch to um, more whole food source by increasing the fiber um, that's going to have a significant impact on um, your gut health and improving um, intestinal health. In incorporating fermented foods into our diet. So people often think think of things like yogurt as in incorporating probiotics, but there's a lot of other fermented foods out there that we can incorporate, like things like sauerkraut, um, fermented pickles, um, and so forth, as well as um, making sure that we're staying hydrated. But by incorporating more fruits and vegetables, we are significantly increasing not just the vitamin mineral content, we're significantly increasing the phytonutrients or antioxidants. All these chemicals from all colors of the rainbow incorporate um, different types of nutrients that have an influence on deto liver detoxification and support detoxification pathways. So I don't know if there's one right answer to say how can I improve detoxification, but one of course is um, eliminate anything that may be causing liver, tox uh, liver toxins, um, and then also incorporating more whole food sources to help improve detoxification. Okay. Well, on behalf of AANMC, we would like to thank Dr. Erlinson for his time. I'd also like to thank all of you for attending our presentation. This webinar recording will be archived and available for listening on our website in about a week or so. So thank you all for attending, and this concludes our webinar. Thanks, guys.